Good morning folks and welcome to the channel or welcome back and in this video we're going to continue to work on the TVR but first I'm gonna have my cup of coffee and then we're gonna have a quick look on all the things we're going to do today and to do all this work we have a couple of new things we've got a new thermostat and we'll check the thermostats out there's a high flow and a normal flow thermostat and you'll see the difference we will test it out as well to see how the thermostat is working this is a wax based thermostat by the way uh, we're going to put up the thermostat in the new uh, cover or the reward cover I should say the fuel pumps I got two of them my original one which I actually kind of cleaned up and verified that the volume is still good that the membrane is good uh, but also have a new one, so I think I will install the new one because um, I don't know how old the old one is, so uh, I could have gone for an electrical one, but I haven't. Uh, we got new hoses, new clamps, we're going to put up a big fuel filter because that's missing on the car and then we need to work on the linkage because the linkage on this car is really was crappy. Remember these springs were connected to the valve cover on the linkage, so we need to fix that. Of course we got a new snare uh, for the alternator, this is the reworked alternator, this is the old alternator that we worked on. Uh, so I took the old one off, I checked that it worked, but I had another one laying around which is probably as good, which I had reconditioned some time ago. And then finally we're going to install the new high tension leads. So a lot of work and maybe if we are lucky we can actually start to work on the cooling system and fit the new radiator in and the new swirl pot. And for the swirl pot, we've got a stainless steel swirl pot, um, so that looks quite nice, although I had some issues with it, but we'll see how that will fit. And I don't know if I can do it in this video, we'll see how far we get. And without any further ado, let's start on the choke system. And this is the choke cable. Now this was so long that I actually had to cut off a piece, so this piece was on it. And last night I did cut it off. You see how long that was? You, you couldn't hardly fit it. So I did cut it off and now we need to connect it to this system here. And to make sure that the choke system is working fine, we're gonna lift off again the uh, air filter so we can actually look inside. So these are the choke butterflies and we checked all that when we did the rebuild of the carburetor. But now that's on the car and it's about zero degrees centigrade, a little bit above it for the moment. Let's check it out. I'm going to give it a bit of trouble and then I'm going to push this level here and see what the butterflies are doing and see they close properly. So that is a good working choke system. So now it's time to hook up that cable. I've cut off on the top some of the plastic because now we need to feed it through this hole here. Now let's see. And there we go. And now that can go in nicely. And you see, uh, this fits real nice and tight. Uh, just going to lock the sleeve off the choke cable, but I don't want to squeeze it too hard. And then actually we will also lock the wire inside, which is actually pulling uh, on the choke mechanism as soon as you pull on the knob inside the uh, driver's compartment. So let me pull that choke cable again. See now they close completely and that's how you want to have it. The next thing we need to install is the linkage to the carburetor and um, I need to connect the spring on the bottom to some point here and that's missing for the moment and I guess uh, we'll lock up some of that stuff because this feels all very loose so I'm going to do some of that and then we'll put it back together. So uh, yeah, let me start with this area right here to tighten that up a bit. So I'm going to take the linkage out for now uh, so that we can clean this up a bit. So we cleaned up the spindle and after a lot of rubbing and some polishing, uh, this came out quite nice. So now we go into uh, fix a, an end point so we have a better support. So this is the actual piece that is holding the linkage onto the frame and I'm going to change that a bit because that's a little bit flimsy. So what I'm going to try to build now is a support mechanism which is a little bit bigger than what we have now. So I'm going to try to make something like this. So a big tap with a hole in the middle where that linkage will come through and then go down like this. And here we'll have the support sitting. So through that hole of that support and then on the outside 
I'm going to have some threading so I can put a big nut up and then through that I have that hole and that's where the spindle or the uh, linkage mechanism will fit in like so so the link linkage will come all the way through so now that's going to give it a much better support than this little plastic thingy and I'm going to make this in nylon and now we have to drill the hole in the middle so we can actually fit the um, linkage through it and this is a 5.5 mil bit so we're going to drill all the way through it now So that's the little piece we've been turning. So now I'm going to put that in there uh, with a washer in the back. And I'm going to put my linkage up, the washer, feed it through the hole, and then just lock that nut. See this big nut here? That's the one we need to tighten up now. And then we should be all set. There we go. And that should just do the job perfectly. I'm just gonna lock it down a bit. So this is the final result of a nice nylon bush, long enough to support this linkage here and look at that, how solid that is. And it just works perfectly. You know, and it doesn't rattle. A lot better than this little plastic thing that we had in there before. I placed a small aluminum plate to put these additional springs up for the throttle to return and before these springs were hooked into the valve cover. Right, so I'm just going to grease these things just a little bit. So let us try the gas pedal and see if this works. That seems to work just fine. You might remember from a previous video that we actually had one revision kit for a Weber degas carburetor whereby the idle needle was really not all that nice machined. So I contacted the store, uh, Jack, and I told him, I said, listen man, this is not good. There's something wrong with this needle. And he felt really uh, annoyed with it in, in, the, in the proper way. So he wants to have happy customers. And, and I can understand that. And today, actually, I got a package in the mail from the store, the carburetor store in the Netherlands. And I didn't really order anything. So when I opened it up, I got like a little nice surprise. And you know, I normally never make a commercial for any store, but this is exception because this looks real nice and cute. So I got the cart. So let's see what's inside. Oops, this is neat. It's chocolate, so it's, it's eatable. Oh, this is really cute, isn't it? I like that. So thanks, Jack. Uh, I'm going to put it on the side, and maybe one day I will eat it on a very special occasion. So the next thing is to install the fuel pump, and I'm having a mechanical fuel pump. I have a couple of electrical fuel pumps laying around, but for this carburetor, you don't need a lot of pressure nor really volume, so the mechanical one is just doing the job right. If you want, you can put a blanking plate on your distribution cover um, and then install a electrical pump, but I'm going to use the mechanical pump. Now, this is my original one, and I did double check it. I did open it up, and the membrane is still good. But of course, it's not really the original one, I think, because it's an AC one, so I think it has been replaced once before. Now, if you're not sure if your fuel pump is working, there's a very simple test, and that's what we used to do in the old shop. We just we take it off, and then wherever there is the intake, you put it on your thumb, and then you just slow, slowly move this around, and um, you will feel if it sucks on your tongue like so. So this is pretty good. Yeah? So um, I'm not really recommending this, but this is old school stuff. 
so this is the uh, renovated pump and I'm just going to keep it on the side and I bought actually a new pump it's exactly the same um, and this is having a good vacuum as well uh, so I'm going to put this one up and then we'll see how that goes uh, if I run into issues and I'll put my old one back but I don't expect anything wrong with this uh, new um, fuel pump it looks pretty good quality in fact better quality than my other one uh, the lever that you see here that's that's picking up actually on one of your distribution wheels uh, which is a bit concave so it's going to move that up and down I'm going to put some grease up and then we'll install it with a couple of uh, uh, seals. I'm going to put three seals up. Um, sometimes you see a thicker one. It depends a bit, uh, depending on the movement that you need to have on the pump. Um, and then, of course, we're going to install a fuel filter, um, which is not on the car right now, but you've seen when we did the carburetor work how much debris there was inside. And of course, we're going to use new hoses. So let's start with this and uh, see how that goes. I'm going to put some corrosion block up. Uh, it's actually kind of a grease. Uh, I'm not sure where it picks on. I think it's actually picking on the bottom. That's where it's riding on that concave uh, wheel that we have inside the distribution cover. It doesn't have to be a lot. That's where the fuel pump goes. And my original seal was real thick. But with the new pump, I've got like three um, smaller seals. So I'm going to put all three up. And it's kind of a spacing method uh, to see if the pump uh, moves enough up and down or not. And that can also be adjusted. So let's slide this in and see how this is going to work out. See, and if you move this around, you should actually hear it. Now, that means it fits properly. So, um, let us lock this down. And then I'm going to rotate around the engine a couple of times with a wrench just to see what happens with this pump, if it actually is pumping. So now we're going to install, first of all, the fuel filter here. And for that one, I'm using one of those clips that came with it. And I'm going to put it over the hose so everything is nicely and tidy. And here is the fuel filter. And if you put a fuel filter up, make sure you have the flow right. So the flow is that way. There's always a marker on it. And now we're going to try to stick this in here. Maybe a little bit of fiddling. I want it to have it all the way to the end. Yep, that's good. You might have noticed I put a little bit of Vaseline on the sides here and that made it slide better. Now I'm putting the clip up so everything is very well locked in place. You don't want to have no leaks. And now we're going to do the hose from the top of the fuel pump. And also here we'll do the same principle. Uh, we'll, we'll check it. And put it on and see how far this needs to go. So I think about this length should be good enough. So let's see if we can get it on. And now we feed it to the filter. And this is now the exit of the filter. And I need to move this clip a bit because it's in my way. All right. And now we take it to the next step from the output of the fuel pump to the carburetor. And I'm using special tube um, for fuel uh, up to 12 bars. So that's a lot of pressure I can put up. And let's see uh, how long that has to be. I think this is about the right length. And now we hook up the return. Okay. 
So the fuel system is now installed. We got the gasoline coming in through the gasoline filter into the fuel pump and then back out to the carburetor and I placed a little grommet here so we don't have any rubbing of this fuel hose on the valve cover and then we have the return going back. Now the problem now is if I'm going to try to start the car I will have to crank it up for a hell of a long time because there's no fuel in the fuel pump, there's no fuel in the actual carburetor, nor is there any fuel in the actual filter, and I cannot prime the system. So what I'm going to do is uh, trying to fill up the fuel pump with a bit of fuel, including the actual carburetor. So hopefully we can get this sorted out. The fuel pump and the carburetor to some extent by using my good old fuel tank that I used before. So gravity will actually do its work. Let's hope so. And I have actually fuel in sight. I'm just gonna rotate the engine a couple of times around now. So I have the pump starting to pump and we'll see if this is working or not. All right. Let me move this aside and I'm going to try not to spill too much fuel and I'm going to try to fill up now a little bit that fuel filter. Well at least we got some fuel in so um, we're not going to be sucking pure air once we try to crank up this uh, engine. So we're going to install the alternator and I want to make sure that the contacts are absolutely clean. So I'm going to use a little pad here and this is the kind of pad that people use to clean up their cameras, the sensors. Um, and the product that I'm using to clean is actually acetone. That makes it really nice and clean. So let's install the alternator and the one I'm having right here is has been cleaned out thoroughly and checked so we should be good. I'm just going to put it in initially like this and then the top part uh, connects over there. So I'm not going to bolt it down yet. Um, I'm going to check first of all the snare that goes on there. And this is the snare that I got for a Ford SX V6 for a TVR and have a look what happens. It's too short. So the issue that we're having right now is that the alternator can't move backwards enough so it's hitting the valve cover and that's why the standard V-belt uh, or snare isn't fitting anymore, it's too short. So you're going to need a snare which is a little bit longer but not too long because you are kind of limited in how far you can adjust this. You see, this is about as far as you can go and, and that's about it. So remember, if you have the alloy covers, then there is more limitation on the alternator and it's actually hitting it. So I can't bring it further down. I can move it backward, as you can see. So that means you need to get a snare which is going to fit properly. And therefore, you cannot use the original snare. So I need about a centimeter more. So the 6233MC uh, is a bit too short. So now the question is, how do you know the right length of the V-belt or the snare that I need to put up? Well, I used a old belt, uh, which is way too large. So I did cut it in two, and then I ran it around the system. And then when it came together, it overlapped a bit because it was too long. I then marked it and then I snapped it off to the right length. So now I have a belt, of course, which is broken, uh, which is having the right length. And then all you need to do is lay it out on a table and take your ruler and just measure how long it is. Uh, and that's just very simple and it's quite accurate. And so you just measure that end to end, you know. And then you see how long that is. And in my case, this was 135, uh, 135 centimeters or 1,350 mils. 
Uh, that allowed me then to look it up in the catalogs uh, of gates uh, to find a belt which was exactly that length and the exact width, which is in this case uh, 10 millimeters. And I found one and then that's the one I just installed. Now it may be different for your car, but that's an easy way to do it. I know there's a lot of other ways of calculating the length of the belt, but this was very easy to do and that's how I did it. Here we go, that just fits nicely. And all I need to do now is pull it back and lock it in place. And that is just working just fine without any major modifications. All right, so let me lock that into place. And I have some clearance on the valve cover, that's good. The only thing you might have to do, if you ever have to take the valve cover off, you might have to remove the alternator. But that's a small thing to do compared uh, to what we would have to do otherwise. Uh, we're going to install the thermostats. And I have two thermostats here. And there is a difference, not only about the temperature when they open up, uh, but there's also something else. And let me show you a little bit of a close-up, and then we're going to do a little test on one of them to see how you can test them when they open up. So we have the two thermostats here. Uh, the brass one is a high flow thermostat. The other one is a low flow thermostat. And the difference is the opening. See how small that is compared to that one? So I'm gonna fit the high volume or the high flow thermostat. But I think I've seen it on the side here, both are uh, 88 degrees centigrade thermostats, which is all right. Now let me turn them over. And in the back, that's all there is to it. There's the tube and the spring, and that's the tube that holds the wax. And the way the thermostat sits in the thermostat housing is like this. So the spring is always down into the block. Keep that in mind. Don't put it the other way around. That's not a good idea to place it like this. That is not done. It's always this direction. So the spring facing the warm side of the engine. And then of course, we've got the cover that goes on top of it. And we also have a seal that goes in between and two bolts. So I placed the thermostat on a stand and now we're going to heat it up with a heat gun, but not too hot. Um, be careful with this. Uh, you don't want to fry it. Uh, I'm going to be doing it on position number one. And if your wife has a hair dryer, you might want to use that one. And I'm going to measure the temperature with a temperature meter and then we'll see when it opens up. So let's start and see what happens. So right now, we've got a temperature of 14 degrees centigrade. Fifty-four degrees. So it's going to happen in a few minutes. It will start to open up and you'll see it descending. And I think it's already started to descend. And now you see the thermostat is actually open. So now the thermostat is open right there. So if I now was to spray some cooling stuff on it, then you will see it's gonna close. See that closing? And if I heat it up again, it's gonna... So and most likely we are now at, let's check it, 75 degrees, but of course this is not 100% accurate. Uh, but this shows how that works, so let's cool it down again. And now you see the thermostat actually closes. First the thermostat goes in, in the right direction. Then we have our seal. And then finally the housing. Uh, I might next year when I'm taking the complete car off the chassis, actually change this um, housing for the thermostat. It's not pitted through, but um, and I'm lucky that the hose is getting there, but uh, it is pitted, so uh, we might want to change that later. All right. Hey. 
And now it's time to put the spark plugs in. I don't think I need to, to rotate the engine anymore. And the spark plugs that I'm always using are NGKs. Uh, I think those are good quality spark plugs. And I'm always using the BPR6ES. Now, it's important that when you put the spark plugs in that you have the right gap set to your spark plugs themselves. Now, this car has an electronic ignition, so the spark is a bit stronger. So I'm setting the spark, um, opening the spark plug gap, which is in between the electrode and the ground. And hopefully you can see that a bit. I will turn it like this. So at the middle you have the electrode and then the ground is there. And the gap in between that is between 0.6 and 0.7 millimeters. And the gauge that I'm using is actually a 0.7. And let's see what we have here. And that's about right. It's a little bit more, so I'm going to tap on it a bit while I'm putting them in. So they're all the same. I have adjusted all the gaps. And I like to give them, uh, each one of them, a little drip of engine oil on the tread. Not a lot, but just a little drip before we put them in. I always put them in by hand, so I never use any strong tools for this. Um, they should go in easily and you, sh you should watch out not to false tread them because that is always possible. And once I've got them in far enough, then I use my wrench but I really don't really torque them down a lot, I just slightly. So now we're going to cable up the uh, spark plugs and uh, have the old distributor here with all the old spark plug leads. Some of them are really cracked and in a bad shape. Um, so I got a new set high tension leads so we're going to put those up now and they're all numbered they have white little labels on them which is quite nice uh, so we'll put them up we know where all the cylinders are right uh, the far inside alternator is cylinder number one two three four five six so it's pretty easy and on the distributor cap uh, that's also easy to remember because what i've done when i took it apart is i actually numbered the plugs and that is going to help me now uh, putting it back together and otherwise, I just look it up in the firing order in the manual and then we'll do it that way. It's easy. So if you need to figure out the firing order on the Ford SX36, then it's pretty simple. Cylinder number one, four, two, five, three, and six. And that's how it fires. And the rotor turns clockwise. Now, in my case, my cylinder number one is right here. So now if we have these leads, all what we need to figure out is which one goes where. And they are kind of numbered. So this is number four. So one, four. So this would be the next one up. So I'm going to hook that in and make sure it connects very well. There we go. The next one is, what do I have here? A number two. So it's one, four, Two. So that should be this lead right here. And this is how we will go through the, all of them and then hook them up. All right, the next one is uh, five. Uh, so five. So. And now it's just a matter of routing these plugs a bit properly uh, so they don't make too much contact with any chassis or metal part. I have cleaned up and checked out the ignition coil and this is a 12 volts coil but you need to use on this specific one you're going to need a uh, ballast resistor. If you don't use it then you're going to have issues with your ignition system so always check out that what type of coil you get if you need the ballast resistor or not. And this is actually the ballast resistor, as you can see, but this guy is a little bit dirty. So um, we're going to do two things. We're going to clean it all up. We're going to clean the contacts and then we're going to check the resistance. So let's see what the, so we've got it cleaned up and I have my ohm meter. So let's see what the resistance is on this guy. And that's about 1.6 ohms. So that is good. It shouldn't be a short and it should not be open. 
And the next thing I did was to remove all these old hoses. And you remember when we did the uh, cooling system check, they were leaking in many different places. So I removed all these hoses, lots of them. And I'm going to rerun this whole circuitry in a different way because I don't think the way it was run was run the proper way. What I drew up here is the hoses that I will connect for the TVR3000M and that's the one without an automatic choke. So I have a manual choke so I don't need to run the tubing through the thermostat. It is also important to know that the water pump has a top opening here uh, which is an output and some of those are actually blocked. Uh, it depends what kind of a pump you have. Now my pump in that case, it's open. Now, if you have a pump where the top uh, outlet is blocked, you can drill it out and then it will work. So, uh, we've got some major components. We've got our thermostat housing. We have a bleed valve. We have a heat control valve. We had a heat exchanger and we have the water pump. Now, I'm not going to show you the radiator and all that because that water is coming in here on the bottom, actually. And, of course, the thermostat is going to the swirl pot. Not important right now. So I'm going to connect a hose from the water pump, the outlet, towards a bleed valve. And then the bleed valve will allow water to flow in two directions. It can flow that way and it can flow that way. So in other words, um, if I'm closing the heat control valve here, then water comes out of the water pump and it flows back into the thermostat housing and that's what it does. If I open up the heat control, water will come out of the water pump, it will hit the bleed valve and it will flow in both directions and it will actually flow into the heat exchange so water will go through this, it will fill up that grid and then it will come back out of that pipe into the heat control valve which is now open or partially open and it returns back to the water pump. So that's the circuit we're going to install. So I need to install about one, two, three, four hoses, a bleed valve and a heat control. Now the bleed valve I have on the car already and the heat control as well. So let me show you those parts so you know what these are. And then we're gonna start uh, tubing all that up. So here we have our heat control valve uh, with an input and an outlet. And on the other side, you've got the controls to close or open it as you can see and that's all it does and I have been able to recover this one and it's still in a good working condition so we're going to reinstall this uh, heat control valve and here is our bleed valve um, nothing really special it's just a T connection which you can actually bleed out through the top by rotating uh, this little part here and then you will bleed air out and to do all this work I'm going to use blue extreme tubes these are high quality tubes uh, that can withstand high temperatures and high pressure. So uh, yeah, let's start installing this. I, I don't think there's too much of interest for you to see on how I'm connecting tubes, but I'm going to show you at the end where they are connected and how they are connected according to the diagram we actually made a few minutes ago. So let me start. It's now an hour and a half later and I have finally all the hoses in place. It was a bit of fiddling, but it went in not too bad. Let me show you. I have one hose coming from the water pump all the way up, goes into the intake of the heater exchanger and I have the bleeding valve right here. That's where we connect it. And the other side of the bleeding valve then runs back around the block, back into the thermostat housing all the way on the bottom there. Uh, it was a bit of routing the tubes. I had to look around for a while to see what the best routing is. Maybe this tube I might still change it once the fenders are in so it comes out a bit more like this. But we'll see. Uh, I made sure that nothing is rubbing on anything so I tied it down here and there. And in the back here uh, we have the hose going back to the uh, heat control valve. And the hose coming back from the heat exchanger uh, is going back into the heat control valve. This is the one right here and on the bottom then it goes back to the water pump. And I still need to hook up the cable here uh, to control it but that's laying around here I think. Yep, here it is. So that will have to go and be installed. This little motor that pumps up water for the windscreen and the wipers uh, doesn't run anymore so I might as well disconnect it, replace it or see if we can actually fix it. So I'm going to try to have a look at it, what's wrong with it, and maybe we can fix it. 
So I took the little motor apart, which is used for the water for the windscreens, and you can actually see it's a small anchor. We have two carbon brushes on it. There's a minus and a plus side on it. And what most likely happened is that the previous owner swapped the terminals around in the wrong direction. And then this little turbine inside turns in the opposite direction. And what happened was that this metal br brass uh, plate in the middle there actually flipped out the slot and moved the whole turbine to one side so it blocked. There's not a lot to it and you probably wonder why the hell do you even bother about doing this. Well, that's just the way I like to do things. I like to fix things and with old stuff you can do this. With newer stuff this is going to be impossible to take it apart and look at it. But I think this is magnificent so I'm going to put it back together. I corrected that little metal blade already and um, if you look closely on the engine here, you see that little cutout? Well, that cutout fits right in there and drives the turbine. And of course, the motor sits in a housing with a magnet around it. I just repainted that one. So I'm going to put it back together uh, one by one. And it's not very hard to put it together, to be very honest. Um, the way you do it is by taking this over here. Then place that in the right direction like so and it's actually key there's a small key here on the side so that's in so, this so here we have the little motor and I pushed it in already so it grabs in this little turbine there and it's, if I turn it you can see how that works if you turn in the other direction it's going to block it and that was the issue so somebody mixed up the polarity although it was marked so now we're going to assemble the front part here um, and for that, I'm going to first put up this brass part, and that is keyed. And I think the smooth surface went on the bottom. And so let's see if we can do this without being too much in the way of the camera. Now that's in. That's good. Now the next thing to put up is actually this seal. And I'm going to use that cover and on the old seal you can actually see there's an indent so all I need to do is place that with that indent on there and not right yet so that's it almost right yeah now I have it right oh man this is really fiddling now it's in so now that can go on there. Now there's a little opening right there and the same opening you'll find over here. So these two have to align. So let me try to put this up like so. I think that's the way it goes on. And before we fit it into the housing, I'm going to give it a little bit of oil. And here is the housing. Uh, I just cleaned it up a bit and painted it. And if you look inside there, all the way in the middle, uh, you see a brass fitting, that's where the motor fits in, and then the ring around it, that's a magnet. So let's see if we can put this together. But before we do so, we have to make sure that we can actually put the brushes up, but these are the brushes. So the brushes, they are sliding in, and I believe this way, uh, this is probably the only way you can actually slide them in. So move the motor apart so I'm going to slide in the bushes so I'm going to slide in first of all the brushes um, like so and now you can actually see the brushes inside so now if you put the motor together we got to make sure that these brushes will open up and maybe I need to remove them first one more time I haven't put this together before so I have no idea so now I can probably do this, place that in there. Now put the brushes up. Uh, I think that will work around the collector. Yeah, that seems to work. And, whoops, yeah. Oh, that's gonna be a little bit of fiddling because the magnet pulls it actually in. So brushes go on, yeah. And I can now slide that on there. Let's see if the brushes are still good. I think they are still good, the brushes. Okay. Whoops, that doesn't work like this. So this is a bit of fiddling, but it will go in eventually. There we go. 
I think everything is now fitted together properly. Uh, unless I think this may go over it a bit. I don't know if this, ah, there we go. That's good. It flipped in. So everything should be all right. I now just need to bend over these little tabs. So on. So what do you reckon? Is it going to work or not? I think it might work. So now I'm going to hook up the battery to it and see what it does. And this is the negative lead. So let's see uh, if it's going to work or not. So I'm going to make contact. Wow, look at that. It works. So folks, I'm going to call it a day. We've done a lot of work on this TVR. And now I'm at the stage where I can install the cooling radiator and all the hoses that will connect to the swirl pot and to the water pump and then we can actually fill up the engine with water or cooling liquid and then we're going to give it to give it a start but that's for the next video thank you for viewing and i'll see you next time bye bye